Hello, people. I'm up at the cabin. Uh, I shouldn't be. I should be back in Detroit working. But I'm up here for a couple of days. I finished the book. Our bones are scattered. The Kanpur Massacres and the Indian Mutiny of 1857. Uh, this is you know, commonly referred to as the Sepoy Rebellion. This is my second book on it. Uh, the first book kind of told the whole story of the whole rebellion. This one kind of focuses on, on a, a town, uh, Kanpur. Uh, it's, it's right on the Ganges River. Uh, it was a, a British outpost. Uh, before this rebellion, the British East India Company was kind of like a privately owned thing, uh, backed up by the military. And all throughout India, they, they had, the British had raised uh, Indian divisions and battalions, and, and uh, they had European officers. Uh, but the Indians weren't real crazy about what was going on. There was a lot of things that, that, uh, forced them into this rebellion. Uh, it's, it's weird when you're reading things and, and uh, you, you kind of, in your head, you take sides and, and, and uh, I don't know why I side with the British on this one, uh. But uh, logically, I shouldn't. Uh, uh, the Indians were just fighting for their independence, for their own country. But they were a bit brutal about it, uh, massacring women and children. Uh, there's this house of the ladies that, uh, where they, they go in there, and, and there's like 180 women and children in there. And uh, first they try to stick muskets through the windows and kill them all, and they, they, they find that they're not going to be able to do it like that. So, so there's five guys that go in there with, with swords and, and kill them all. And uh, I don't know, it's hard to, it's hard to rationalize that kind, of, that kind of brutality. You end up, I, I end up being happy when I read in the book about the British excesses as they march back in. And, and the British were just as brutal when they marched back in. They just hung people everywhere they found them, whether they were part of the rebellion or not. There was a very few Indians that remained loyal, and uh, I'm sure that a lot of them got caught up in the hangings. They burnt villages, uh, you know, they... they uh, they would force uh, pork down a Muslim's throat before they, before they hung him. They would force beef down a, a Hindu's throat before they hung him. Uh, it, it, it's a very brutal episode of, of human history. I got quite a few notes here. This, this book was published in 1996. It is the first edition. It's 554 pages. The mutiny was in 1857. It really was all over by 1859, mostly by 1858. Uh, Andrew Ward is the author. Uh, my first little bit of reading is, is uh, in the foreword. I have to use Roman numerals for that. Page 22. Not great on my Roman numerals. Obviously, because it doesn't go to page 22. <laughs> what the hell? Uh. I can't find it, but they compare the they compare what's going on here to uh, to Custer and then to Wounded Knee. Uh, <coughs> I 
by San Luana and then to the King's Kraal. Uh, it's colonialism breeds brutality. It really does. As does slavery. Uh, top of page 90. Uh, this is about uh, I don't actually don't know why I got this on the outskirts of the dismal, dismal station stood a thriving outpost of the board of four missions of the Presbyterian Church in the United States it may seem strange that in the early 19th century, before slavery had been abolished, before much of the American continent had even been settled, pious young Yankees would venture all the way to India to spread the gospel. But now that India had, had been almost entirely pacified, its heathen millions captured the imagination of hundreds of young Americans swept up in the evangelical fervor of the day. Uh, that was one of the reasons for the rebellion. Uh, the Indians did not want their religion taken away. One of the big reasons uh, was the British at that time were switching the infantry rifle. And they also switched how you load the thing. It was a packet that had the bullet and the charge in it, and you had to tear it open with your with your front teeth. And there was a little bit of grease involved in this. The Indians got word that, you know, it was pig fat, and, you know, they couldn't really touch that, much less put it into their mouth. So, that was one of the big reasons. The missionaries were another big reason. The, the Indians were not crazy about that. They were very serious about their religion. Last paragraph, page 192. Uh, the Christian drummers who composed the fatigue parties could not afford to be ceremonious. The heads of expired senior officers, like Colonel Williams, bumped and lolled as their dusty corpses were dragged by the feet down the veranda steps and slung onto handcarts or rolled into litters. As the outpickets intensified their fire on the rebel snipers in the unfinished barracks, the drummers hurried the cadavers eighty yards beyond the parapets, lunging in the dark along the line of overturned vehicles and tipping their burdens into the well, turning to rush back to the entrenchment as the dead tumbled sixty feet to the bottom and landed with a soft, echoing splash. By the end of the siege, some 350 bodies would accumulate in the dark throat of the burial well, and the distress was so great, remembered Jonah, that no one could offer a word of consolation. This Kanpur, they the, the officers kind of waited a long time because they were hoping that their their uh, divisions, their battalions, would stay loyal. Uh, eventually, they rebelled. So they waited a little bit too long before they built some kind of a redoubt where they could uh, retreat to and defend themselves while they were waiting for reinforcements and relief. Uh, the entrenchment was not a good, not a good place for 500 people to to try and wait out this rebellion. The, the Indians arranged artillery all around the thing and they were able to cannonade at will. And, you know, you would just be sitting there and, and all of a sudden a round shot would take your head off. Uh, all day long people were getting killed. All day long people were dying of various diseases, dysentery, uh, they had to, to run to another well to get their water, getting shot as they ran to get their water. They held out for a couple of weeks. 
and the Indians decided to offer uh, surrender terms. And the surrender terms included everyone being able to march out with their weapons and get onto boats and sail down the Ganges River to, to other areas that the British still held. Uh, apparently the Indians, because the British were a different religion or something like that, they, they saw no, they saw nothing wrong with just using the treaty as a trick. And when they got everybody into the boats, they began to fire on them with cannon and with muskets. And they killed a lot more of them there. The remainder, they marched back into the city. The men were separated, separated from the women, and the men were lined up against a wall and shot. The women were all put into a room, and I, I already talked about that. Uh, they, they left them in there for maybe 10 days. They were dying in there of, of dysentery and, and malaria, and then they decided to kill them all. So the entrenchment, that, that's what that is. That's where they were stuck. Third paragraph, page 202. The guy's name was Wheeler. He was in charge of the entrenchment. Third paragraph, 202. Shortly after the bombardment began, Wheeler had ordered the garrison's horses set adrift, for there was neither shelter nor food for them. Crazed with thirst, many of them had congregated around the well between the barracks, where they were struck by the rebels' most concentrated fire, and fragments of their flesh fell in and polluted the water. <coughs> A few shell-shocked animals still hung about the parade ground, trapped by the encircling batteries booming in the distance. On the night of June 8th, Captain Jenkins' picket shot one of these bewildered beasts and dragged it into the unfinished barrack. They cooked nondescript pieces of it in a fire and reserved the head and some mysteries of the body for a soup, though it was nothing against the multitude. They stretched this grisly broth as far as it would go. Page 394. Uh, the first-hand account, and this is part of the, by this time, the release the relief force is marching to the rescue, belatedly. And human beings there were none to be seen. The swamps on either side of the road, the blackened ruins of huts now further defaced by weather stains and mold, the utter absence of all sound that would indicate the presence of human life or the employments of human industry, such sounds being usurped by the croaking of frogs, the shrill pipe of the cicada, and the under-hum of the thousands of winged <laughs> insects, engendered by the damp and heat. The offensive odor of the neem trees, the occasional taint in the air from suspended bodies, upon which before our very eye the, lo the loathsome pig of the country was engaged in feasting. All these things, appealing to our different senses, contributed to call up such images of desolation and blackness and woe as few, I think, who were present will ever forget. This is getting a little bit long. I'm going to try and hurry through this. Second, 397. As Havelock's bone-weary troops fell asleep a mile and a half beyond Fatapur, a nearly ma naked man, worn to a shadow and much embrowned by exposure, came staggering into camp. He was Ensign Brown of the Conpore garrison, whom Wheeler had sent off under the late Lieutenant Rakes with a detachment of the 56. For six weeks now, wild and haggard, young Brown had been swimming along the Ganges, tortured by the flaming sunshine, gnawed by hunger, bereft almost of hope, but sustained by a few friendly villagers along the way. Half mad from exposure, Brown now asked permission to join Havelock's volunteers and return with them to Kanpur. There was a few people like that that, that ended up surviving this thing. Uh, 452. Top of 
Uh, and I have uh, a little explanatory note there. Kanpur is relieved, Lucknow also is relieved, and the garrison is brought to Kanpur, which is again under siege. Uh, Kanpur got relieved first. They marched to Lucknow, took the women and children, brought them back to uh, Kanpur, and they got under siege again. The first man let out was a fine-looking young sepoy with good features and a bold, resolute expression. He begged that he might not be bound, but this could not be allowed, and I had his wrists tied tightly, each to the upper part of, the wheel, of a wheel of the gun. Then I depressed the muzzle until it pointed to the pit of his stomach, just below the sternum. The young sepoy looked undauntedly at us during the whole process of pinioning. Indeed, he never flinched for a moment. Then I ordered the port fire to be lighted and gave the word fire. There was a considerable recoil from the gun and a thick cloud of smoke hung over us. As this cleared away, we saw two legs lying in front of the gun, but no other side of what had, just before, been a human being and a brave man. At this moment, perhaps from six to eight seconds after the explosion, down fell the man's head among us slightly blackened, but otherwise scarcely changed. It must have gone straight up into the air, probably about 200 feet. Uh, that's what they did. They, they, they called it firing from the gun. But you didn't really fire them from the gun. You tied them in front of the gun. Uh, when they didn't feel like uh, uh, hanging, they, they, that's what they did. 487. The first day I amputated eight limbs, dressed more than eighty wounded men, scarcely knowing night from day, eating beef and biscuit and drinking tea and water whenever I could get a chance. Three round shots passed through my hospital roof, bringing down plenty of tiles and dirt but injuring no one. All my clothes were spoilt with blood. I went about in my shirt sleeves bareheaded. My hair was matted with blood, my arms and hands covered. Blood spurted from arteries into my mouth and eyes. I was indeed all blood. In one week I saw more surgery than most surgeons see in a lifetime. And I trust I have improved myself. That's it. I did mark a paragraph about the House of the Women. But I'm not going to read that. That's, that's, it, it is just so brutal. Uh, very interesting stuff. Myself, uh, atrocity like that is a big page turner for me. Thank you for watching.